going to talk about a, a subject this morning that's a, a little tougher, and especially if you've gone through some things, a little tougher to, to chew on. Um, but it is meat, and it is something that can change your life if you're able to get a hold of how do we work through grief? How do we work through the grief and loss process? You know, what does it look like? Um, what does the Bible say about it? And I believe I'm going to be speaking this Sunday and next Sunday on it because there's no way I can get all the material in and... and and rock that the way I need to. Um, so I want to go through the, the grief process to begin with. Now you can go online and you can see, you know, probably three, four different ways that they lay out the grief process. And on the slides, it's a, it's a, a circle. Um, but almost all of them say shock happens first, right? Shock is when you've been... Uh, when something's been subtracted from you, when you've been traumatized, when you've been shocked in a way where it's, it's the feeling is like, I, I didn't see that one coming. I had no idea this was going to happen. Or even when I did see it coming, like someone's going to pass away. They've been maybe working on that for six months. You know that it's coming, but there's still a certain aspect that it really did finally hit, right? Different than if someone passes in a car accident and you had no expectation of that. Um, it, it hits you. Your body physiologically will react to shock. You'll, you'll start to, you can have anything from numbness in your legs to numbness in your, in your extremities. Uh, heart rate pace goes up, uh, dryness in the mouth, sweaty palms, uh, just a feeling of loss, a feeling of confusion can come on you with that. Uh, and we usually uh, only really look at grief or processing that for the big gun stuff, right? A death is a big gun thing. You know, so we'll say, oh, that's where, where grief is, is put. But we don't realize that we grieve over all kinds of things a lot. You know, we usually put it to death. That's the, that's the one where, well, they're grieving. We can be grieving the loss of... Uh, um, well, one time, I was on my way to being a doctor. I was very excited about it. Got all the classes lined out, started the classes, was really rocking on the thing, and then the school closed. That interpreted inside of me like a death because this was that one that fit in my, you know, this is like miraculous to fit in my timing where I could actually graduate this. <laughs> Try to put me in a school that doesn't work right now. I, I really wanted that to take place, and there was a grieving. There was a shock, like, say what? The school just closed? Like, how does the school just close? I mean, there was all these emotions that came up. And uh, maybe my, my extremities didn't go numb. Maybe I didn't have the, the, you know, the lump in my throat or the palpitating heart or any of those kinds of things. But it was a form of shock, especially when you had your regiment and you had your hopes and you had all that, and then it just crashed. It was like, okay. So I had to go through some things to bring that to close. And so it's not always... Um, that when we go through a grieving process, it's not always that it's a death. But that felt like a death to me. Not as bad as, a, you know, uh, an actual death, but it, do, it interprets inside of you. If you had an expectation and that expectation just got kicked out from underneath you, you'll suffer the same feelings of loss. They'll be at a smaller degree. Well, in some cases, they'll be just as high of a degree, depending on what it is. And so we don't understand that there's a process you go through of shock. Some people put bargaining to the right of that, uh, to the right of that shock, and uh, we should have a slide for that. Um, and, and some put denial. I, I think you can bargain on either end of the circle. And bargaining starts where it's like you're starting to come out of shock enough to go, this can't be. God should have took me instead of them. This should have went this way. We, and we, we're searching for some lever that we can pull, something that we could change the situation. There's got to be something we can do. That's what will come up inside. And if we're not careful, we'll come up with all kinds of different ways that we're going to bargain our way out of this, even if it means uh, harming ourselves. In certain situations, people will go into bargaining mode and, and they'll actually sell themselves out, trying to get the situation to change because there's such shock that it actually took place. So um, if you bargain for a while, and it can just even be for moments. You're at the hospital, somebody passes, it's unexpected. You'll go into this can't be, I shoulda, coulda, woulda, usually follows that. And then many times we'll go into denial. 
And uh, denial is where you got to lie to yourself about it. The, the pain and everything is so deep that we have to convince ourselves it's not as deep as what we think. Right? This can't, this can't be happening. No, I'm not feeling this. I don't receive this. I don't accept this. I don't. There's that kind of thing. And uh, we can get stuck in that. You can be stuck in that for months. You can be stuck in shock for months. But as we're moving through the, the uh, grief process, then when we're in denial and it gets very upsetting to us, um, after a while, we get angry because we've done the thing where we've come out of shock and we've realized it, we begin to cry, we begin to be upset. It's like, this is really happening. Well, anger is a secondary emotion. So you feel something first and then you have anger. Anger says, I want something to stop. I want this thing that happened to me to stop now. I want it gone, I want it done, I want it over. Why, how come, I don't see why. You should have, you know, anger will go out. You should have done that. You should have called, you should have, whatever the situation is. I've been at the hospital where families um, are gathering and somebody's about to pass away and it's like, man, sometimes it's best the family don't show up. It's a war zone because they're already coming from shock and denial and they're, and they're already popping up into that anger that just said, uh-uh. Well, you should have called mom more often. What are you talking about? You didn't call, blah, blah, blah. And there's a fight about something, and the person's that you really should be with the person you're trying to say goodbye to. But it doesn't end up that way, so anger can really you know, come up. And then we'll sit in that anger. Sometimes you can sit in that anger. Some of you might be grieving something where you're stuck in the anger zone, and it's been 15 years. And you're still saying, I want something to stop. I want something to stop. And, uh, but if you're able to work through that, coming up out of anger is when you've cried the cry enough, when you've done the, the, the degree of all these other emotions enough, where you're finally saying, I just got to let this out. I just got to bring this to some type of closure. I just got to say what it is. I'm falling apart. This is too much, too little, too late, whatever it is that you're feeling. And... Um, it's actually healthy when we get into that, right? And finally, we'll have that breakdown moment where it's like, huh, we'll just like go. And you can actually come up out of that, if need be, and go right into uh, closure. But a lot of times, we're not able to cross from anger uh, over into closure. And we go back into bargaining. There has got to be a way. There's got to be something I can do, some kind of things. Huh? And really, what we're saying inside is, I don't accept this. I don't receive this. No, not doing this. No, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to cry anymore. I'm done with whatever. And if you're not careful, something can trigger it. You can go right back into shock and the, the cycle starts all over. You can go through this cycle in a day. You can go through the cycle within an hour. Boom, boom, boom. I watch people when somebody's passing just go around that. And a lot of emotion. You can be stuck in one thing for six months, then go to the next thing for another three months, then go to the next thing for another three weeks. I mean, it all depends on who you are and how you process and what the subject really is and how much it's, it's caused pain there. When we take all of this and uh, we don't process it right, we press it in. And so the word depression means to be under, to press in, sunken below normal levels. When you take not processing this and you uh, press it in one thing at a time, one emotion at a time, one thing at a time, it's going to press into the point, you know, there's not much room left in you. Um, it's to be under, to press in, sunken below normal levels. It will actually paralyze you. If we don't process the grief process right, it can paralyze us. Um, there's a slide that has these words on it, I believe. Um, the word grief means a deep mental anguish over loss or a deep mental sorrow. The word grieve means sorrowful, to be distressed, to mourn. The word grave and grief are from the same root word. Isn't that interesting? You know, when they walked with the God the Father in the cool of the day, um, I don't think he was giving them speeches about how they're going to grieve. There was no sin. There was nothing that could cause lack. There was nothing that could cause trauma. There was no, yeah, they're just walking with the Father. He didn't give them a whole training, Adam and Eve, on like, hey, here's, here's what we're doing. You know, don't 
Don't get too excited about the garden because eventually you're going to grieve and it's going to hurt like crazy and you're not going to know what to do with yourself and all of those things. It was not in his intention that we would ever grieve. It wasn't there. Now, does that mean there's no such thing as grief? No, there is. And it's a result of sin and sin traumatizing us. And it's a result of death. And it's a result of those enemies of the cross. It's a result of that. And so when we dare to love someone and they depart from us, there's a grief. And some people believe, well, you should never grieve. Well, then that you're in total denial of all your emotions. You should work through what's actually in there. And there's no sin in that. But you can't put a timer on that for just everybody. I've, I've heard this so many times. They'll, you know, somebody will be sharing a story. Well, you know, Phyllis is still grieving her hu husband. It's been like four weeks. I'd have packed up the stuff already and got it out of the house. Well, that's good if that's what you feel to do. But Phyllis might not be at that point. She might need to let it sit there for a while. She might need to think about it and process it. She might have, some, have somebody come alongside of her and help work through that. The word grave is when you bury or let go of something or someone. That's really uh, where the word grave came. It's not a plot necessarily, like, oh, that's a grave. No, it's, a, it's actually like a verb that's in motion, like I'm graving this situation. I'm grieving this situation. It's the same thing. And so what we're, we're saying is you, you're burying it or you're let going something, which doesn't necessarily mean when it's an emotional thing, it happens overnight. It is a process to bury this thing. It's a process. And it's not the kind of bury that says, we're going to bury this so we don't have to think about it. It's, you've heard the term laying something to rest, right? It's very similar to bringing something to close. The things that we don't have closure on, our subconscious tries to solve 24 hours a day. Yeah. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. Whether you want to think about it or not, your subconscious is trying to think about it. And so when we look at the word grave, when you bury or let go of something or someone, um, we got to know that there's a process. And we got to have a plan in that process or we don't grieve properly. And sometimes something shocked us and happened to us, and we don't have a plan because we're in shock. So that's when it's really nice for church people or friends or somebody to come alongside of you and say, let's make a plan. Let's walk through this. Let's take this to closure, right? And um, sometimes we don't have that person, and it just brings us all over again feeling violated, and we go into shock all over again about a whole new subject. And some of you have gone through that where one subject compounded upon another subject and on another one. And hurt begat hurt begat hurt. The reason we're visiting this is because of the paralyzation. Grief left unchecked and brought to closure will paralyze you. You will not be able to move ahead. Uh, and this is why. Faith is an action word, right? We serve an action God. So he's always in motion. He never sleeps or slumbers. He's always in motion. There's studies that have been done that, you know, regarding the sphere of his rule that give different scriptures talking about he, he literally is he's moving like this. Oof all the time. Just like our cells, the cells and the energy in our cells. Oof, he's moving in us. That's what lets our body know we're alive. The life that's in the cells has movement. There's oxygen traveling through. The breath of God is in us. And when that stops, we die, right? Well, I don't believe Christians die. I believe we let go. There's a difference. Yeah? There is. We, we, you know, people say, don't fear death. Oh, well, no, because uh, I'm just going to let go when it's time to go. To die almost seems like the reaper. This is the picture. The reaper's coming for you. Right? And then he has so, say so, and you never know when this is going to happen. When you are in Christ, unless there's a, an accident, unless we made poor choices, unless someone else made a poor choice or there's something like that, um, and it's a suddenly, I mean, we got any say in the matter. We just let go. Yep, amen. Ever, been, ever been with somebody who they're like, yeah, I think I'm going to let go? They just let go. Uh, there's been many people waiting in the nursing home even, you know, waiting for their family members, and they're waiting for them to uh, just, I, I, I'm not going to let go until I see my son. 
And they got to wait another week. The doctor says they'll only make the night. And guess what? Next week, they're still there until they see their son. Interesting enough, the next day or within the next hour, they let go. So we're not so vulnerable to death as death would like us to think. I just wanted to throw that in there. So um, when we have an expectation, uh, it's usually built on forward motion, right? The good things that we're headed for are built on forward motion. That's where faith comes involved. So hope, that joyful, confident expectation of something good is there, and it activates our faith, and we're in forward motion. And where we get in shock is anything that stops that motion suddenly or reroutes that motion. Um, and it's like, hold, hold on a second. I just got derailed. I'm the train that just got derailed. We, we got to get back on the track. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that can happen real often. Some of you have happened where you're, the whole train went off the track. You got derailed. This was not expected. This was too much is how it felt. And it took a lot of people to help get that train back on the track so you could end up being in forward motion. The thing that, that darkness is after, the thing that grave is after, is that forward motion. Is your destiny to get you out of your destiny. You can take the death of a, of a grandma and let it take you out of your destiny just by not bringing it to closure just by not keeping it in forward motion. So if God's always in forward motion and you go into shock, it's st shock is literally, I can't move. That's when faith says, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't know where to go. I you just stop. You almost can't breathe. Or you're not in a, in a, in a reality at that point. I always share the story of my my brother, uh, Bruce, was driving a big old Cadillac and down a side road, and somebody T-boned him from the side, just poof, smashed that thing. And he had glass sticking in his head and everything else, and the officer opens the door. They could finally get the door open, and he steps out, right? Major accident. He steps out, and they said, sir, we're, we're going to need you to come with me to the ambulance. Can you, can you walk? Can you, I'm fine. I'm fine. He was in total shock. I'm fine. I, you know, no, sir, I really think you need to, because he couldn't see all this blood and everything like that. He was fine. And so they're trying to get him to the ambulance. They're trying to walk him on over, and he's like, no, I'm good. Don't mess with me, right? So he starts walking, and next thing you know, woof, he collapses, passed out. He had no idea that was coming. He had no idea what was happening because he was in such a state of shock. Now, a lot of times we'll think that shock is more like a, ah, you know, and somebody jumps out and they shock you like that. Well, that's a form of shock. But hang time shock is that, that it paralyzes you. You're literally like, I, uh, and you're not aware of your surroundings because there's such a high burst of adrenaline. The adrenaline is so high, it just kind of shuts down things, and then suddenly your thinking capabilities are not where they should be. And you're not in touch with your surroundings anymore because adrenaline always causes us to go, woof, and we think about the moment. We think about what's right in front of us. We think this. And we're not able to see some of those other things. I'm describing more of a, you know, if you went through a loss of a loved one or, you know, someone passes in a car accident or something like that, I'm describing that. But we're going to take that same concept into our emotional base of divorce, of finding out someone's cheated on you, of being told something, you found out they lied to you. There's grief that goes with that. There's having a trust and laying out your life to somebody and they just walk all over you. Had no idea that one was coming. Oh, there's a grief. There's thinking that we got a group of people. Here's our group. These are our people. These are our friend group or whatever. And three of them leave and there's no explanation and they won't talk to you. There's a grief that goes with that. That is a suddenly, that is the same thing. Grave starts taking place, right? That grave goes into motion. That grieving goes into motion. And you can go into shock. You can be walking around for days going, well, I don't get it. You can be walking around for months going, I don't get it. Why? 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 And if you get stuck there, you'll find that the event shocked you out of faith in an area. Because God's 
faith motion is moving ahead. It's taking you to your destiny. It's time, right? It's, time is very spiritual, right? The day belongs to the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. It is his timing every minute, every second. And every minute and every second is, is put in his calendar and it's in movement just like his faith. But when something happens, power of sin, or something happens that we made a poor choice, or something happens that we just didn't see that one coming, or whatever it is, there's a trauma, there's sin-based things that take place in this, this earth, it like kicks you out of that time. And suddenly, you're on your own time, wandering around in circles, trying to figure out what you do next. When God's here moving. And it's very difficult to then pull yourself back in to where he's headed, because you're in shock. And this is where the church needs to understand this. There's no pat answer to grief. Yeah, exactly. There's faith answers to grief, but there's no pat answers. The old forgive and forget, just forgive and forget, probably not gonna just work up front. Sometimes we need to be held. Sometimes we need to have someone come alongside of us and say, you know what, it's gonna be okay. God's got this. I need you to look at me. We're going to come back over here to faith. And I'm saying this because, you know, I, I always give the example of, you know, 9-11 when uh, different officers went into that building or people that were presently in that building went into their training mode. They were in shock too, but they were able to go into their training mode. The thing that they trained for so much, they set their grief aside and said, we're coming over here. They would go to the people who were froze on a stairway and say, I need you to look at me. Come with me. We're going to go out this door right now. What's your name? And come alongside and help walk them out. Well, why can't they just be in faith and just walk out? Because they're in shock. Because it hurts. See? So faith answers many times. We like to just slap a, a thing on that. We're trying to help somebody. Well, I don't know what to do with your grief, so you should just forgive and forget. Or you just, you just need to pray through, sister. Okay. Most Christians know we need to pray through. That's still not helping us move through the grief. Now, can I take, like, if, if you're grieving really hard on something, can I just come into your zone and take that grief on me and take it away from you? No, it has to be brought to closure in you. I can't close something out in me and it didn't get closed out in you. It has to be brought to closure in you. And so that means I can only come alongside of you. And why am I coming alongside of you? I'm helping. I need you to look at me. I need you to focus. What's your name? We're about to leave this burning building. I need you to follow me. Come with me quickly. I have you. And the person, many times people will be in such shock, they just you know, and, uh, and sometimes you almost have to say, hey, you know, look at me. We got to go now because uh, they're in shock. And so we have to have the body knowing how to move in a way where we can, hey, say, come on, I know where the light is. Amen. Right over here. Come on, I'm in faith right now. I say right now, right? When you're helping that person, you're in faith right now. But there's times you're grieving something and you need somebody else to come along and say, I need you to look at me. Right Now, the biggest, uh, if you want to say person, to do that is Holy Spirit. It's Holy Spirit. The more we are able to get with him, he is the comforter. But what if we're still not understanding where he's at and I don't really know him that well or even know how to listen or hear his voice? The body of Christ needs to move. Right. Same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in us. And so we're bringing that to this grave situation. We're bringing this as we're helping the person bring that to close. And we can't just run a person through and don't expect yourself to be run through uh, a grief like you're run through a knothole. Here, let me drag you through this and then you should be fine. What is it, day two now? You should be over it. We're built a little bit more intricate than that. We are able to love deep. And we fall far short of how God loves. But even with our, our little bit of knowledge of love, we're able to love deep. We're able to feel love a lot. And we're also able to feel hurt. And we are also uh, get shocked by things that were never intended for this body to experience. We get shocked by it. It was never intended for me to have to say goodbye to my grandma. 
That wasn't God's plan. But because death came on the scene, now there, there is a letting go. And I'll be here, and she's there, and the next person will be there, and I'm still here, and eventually I'm going to let go, and you'll have to say goodbye to me if you're still here. It's a process nobody really wants to talk about, um, and, and we definitely know it's a process that uh, doesn't get dealt with well because funerals are always intense. It's intense. Nobody really, uh, we don't know what we do, you know? We'll put on our funeral face. We go in. We don't know. We don't know many times what to say to the person. We don't know how to work them through something. We, we don't know if it's happened to our, ourselves. Who's even going to be there to help? It's kind of messy. And I think the church should shore that up. Yeah. Don't you think so? Don't you think so? There, and it, sometimes we can even have it in a church situation where everybody just really loved a certain person or, or whatever, and, and they moved to Chicago, and they're gone. And there's, there's a certain thing in your head that just goes, well, I should be fine with that. They're just moving. But you feel the whole. They're not there anymore. And if a person leaves a, a, a body or a group like this where we're getting really close, and all of a sudden they leave, and they leave disgruntled, that's a whole different kind of grieving. But there is a grief. And it has to be brought to close. There has to be a way to bring that to close. And, and a lot of that I'll be talking about next Sunday. But I want to explain some of, you know, some of how grief works to begin with. Because sometimes we don't know. It's just like last night I talked about uh, 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 sabotage. When we go to sabotage something, we don't really know that we sabotaged it until we sabotaged it. Well, there are 15 steps before we ever got to sabotage that took place before this event of sabotage happened. Well, it's very much when we're working through grief or we're experiencing, sometimes it'll happen to us. We're not even aware we're grieving. All of a sudden, we're frustrated, we're mad, and we're irritated, and I don't know, we want to kick the dog, or there's something going on. And we don't translate it to that. It's, it's you know, well, these kids shouldn't let the toys lay around, and I don't see, and how many times do we have to talk? It has nothing to do with what you're really feeling. It's just how it's coming out when we're grieving something. So to be stuck in grief is not God's will. For this reason, it paralyzes you. And when you're paralyzed, the thing that paralyzes you in that is you're not operating in your faith. There's no faith to move forward. The faith that's inside you is, is that verb word that's trying to move and that's part of the pain. There's a blocker that says, you ain't getting anywhere. You ain't getting anywhere. And it just keeps hitting up against that blocker. Your faith is still in there. God gave you a measure of faith. And all you need is the, the small little mustard seed faith to uh, say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast in the sea. You don't doubt in your heart. You shall have whatsoever thing you ask. That's all you need. It's not like we need more faith. We just need to use the faith that we have. But that's the thing that gets paralyzed by the power of death. And we can't just translate that into when somebody passes away. Death is a, a whole different cat than just somebody checking out and going to an alternative place. Death is that, you know, uh, that thing. Well, what does sin produce? The payday of sin is death. You might not just drop over dead today, so it's not necessarily that death. It's that thing that gets around you and messes with your faith till you're so out of hope, you're helpless. And when you're helpless, you can't move, and you are a sitting duck for the devil, right? He goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He, you know, contrary to popular belief, really, he's not always after the big dogs who are presently in faith. I mean, even a lion, when they hunt, they don't go after, you know, the biggest bull that's just so fast and everything. They go after the person who's in a weak spot or the thing that's in a weak spot. You can't get out, and they know it, and they're like, ah, gotcha. So this is where grief can literally put you in a spot where you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. And this is why, as a body, we shouldn't be judging people. Uh, you know, where it's like, well, they should be over that by now. It's been a year. What we should be doing is saying, I don't know when they're going to get over this, but we're going to put some faith in action. And let's go minister to them Amen. until they're set free. Yep. And the power grave comes up off of them. And the grieving comes up off of them. There's so much when it's a loved one, sometimes we feel like we need to stay grieving as a place of honoring them. 
if we stop, then I guess you didn't love them. You know, you only grieve for two years. Should have grieved for five. Um, we're not letting go of the love of a person. We're letting go of the shock and the bargaining and the, the denial and the expressing of that anger and all the stuff that's wrapped around the pain of the loss. That's the greater thing. I mean, you come to the conclusion that if grandma has passed away, she is gone, right? I mean, that's probably not the hardest thing after you come out of the shock of it or whatever uh, to, to grab a hold of. The hardest thing is what do you do with you and your emotions? Where do you put you in this thing? Now everything has changed. One person passing in a family can change the whole dynamics of a family. Ever experienced that or seen that? Whole dynamics. I mean, uh, when Vern's mom passed, um, she was like the person who organized everything. All of a sudden, everything was like, you know, I'm, I will. <laughs> nobody knew what to do. Um, and it, it caused a whole different kind of grief. I mean, she's gone, and we, and we love her, but we know where she is, you know, and it really ain't going to be that long till we're over there and be with her again. But it ricocheted through the family where everybody was like, I don't know how to be, because she usually, and now I'm not sure, I mean, who's going to step up to that? I don't know. Ha, ha. And there's this loss feeling, and that causes it to make you mad. Why did she leave to begin with? See, because now we have all these changes we actually have to come up and mature into. We have to think through. And any change um, causes that feeling. Well, crisis, we've gone over this here before. Every crisis requires decisions and provokes change. Anytime something happens that's considered a crisis, and a crisis can just be, uh, you know, something left, something changed. It, it can be something small that can create that feeling inside of you of crisis and insecurity and that fear. So you can either go into fear faith or you can grab a hold of the faith that says, actually, I got to get to where God's going and he's in motion. But wait, no, no, no. I can't go where God's going. I'm grieving right now. That's why we don't do it because he's in motion and we feel so hurt and so ugh that it's, it's like, how do I get back into the motion of where he's going and be in faith, in that faith movement when I'm not done grieving yet? Well, what determines when you're done? That's a good question, isn't it? What determines when we're, when we're done? And, and who says we can't still go through all those emotions but be right tight in where he's at and moving? Who made the rule that you sit still, paralyzed, you can't move, we got to think about this, we're going to have to process this, we got to talk about this for the next year, I don't even know what to do, maybe I'll lose my job, I just can't even function. I mean, there's some times that it'll get that much paralysis. Some days, though, when you're going through something like that, best thing you can do is get up and take a shower. Get moving. Put some faith into motion that says, I'm going to do something today. I'll do one thing today, two things today, or whatever. See, what we're doing by that is not going to denial of what we lost. We're saying, this isn't going to pull me out of my faith. Amen. This isn't going to pull me out of that motion that moves ahead. I got to stay tight with the brotherhood, the sisterhood that's moving. And we all grieve at different things at different times. And that's when, when you come together corporately, if a body is moving in faith, it'll just suck you right into that. And you want to be sucked right into that because it's, it, you don't want to be stuck rehearsing over and over. And you should and you could and you whatever it is. Closure is when you answer those questions with faith and you're able to say, here's where God has me going in my destiny. This hurts like crazy, but I'm not going to get off the ride. Amen. Something in me has to mature up so that I can go over here into faith. So let the faith of God pull me forward. Let the word of God pull me forward. And guess what? It'll even hurt more. It'll hurt more because you're actually dealing with it. It actually hurts more than closing the blinds, curling up in a ball and being on your bed in a dark room, you know, three days in a row. It hurts more when you go, I'm gonna get out of bed and I'm, I'm going to get back on that track 
and I'm going to be in faith for my destiny. Now there's some things I got to take care of, some calls I got to do, some things that need to happen, but I'm not going to be derailed. And you stand in faith for your destiny and your life, and it hurts like crazy. You will feel the fullness of whatever your loss is when you do that. It hurts. It feels like your, your, your stomach's going to come right out your throat. And for those of us who have suffered something, you know what it's like to get up and have to go to work the next day. Like you can't call in. You, you got to go to work the next day. Well, inside, you can stay in a grieving spot where it's like this has me. There is no faith or whatever. Or you can just make a choice. I don't know how this is going to work, but I am coming over into where faith is at. And this is what faith says. Oh, the argument that will happen in the inside of you. His word says this, and the grief will say, shut up. I am crying right now. I know, but we're still going to get up and do this because I'm not going to get out of his timing because of this thing, this act, this thing that took place. I'm not going to be derailed by this. And if you position yourself like that, there'll be actual people that, you know, I'm not saying you're not standing doing what you need to do in your destiny and tears just rolling down your face but you're setting your faith to come up. And there may be people, if you're not crying, think there's something wrong with you because you, you should be home grieving. You should really be grieving this. Well, how long do I grieve and when's the moment I come up in faith again? That's all my choice. It's my choice to do that. That's a hard concept, right? Because the thing we want when we're grieving the most is we want comfort. But if we're not careful, we'll want comfort and pity. It'll go from comfort to pity. And, it's, and when you get caught in pity, it's hard. It's a trap. It's a snare. It'll catch you, and it'll paralyze you, and it'll be like, you ain't going anywhere. You need to stay here. And when we bury this thing, you're going to be buried with it. That's what the power of sin says. See, because it's an, it, it feels like an act against you, especially if it's something where you had an argument, you know, and somebody left you, or you find out some, a spouse cheated on you, or there, there's something that was just so shocking, so violating, so like, blah. You can either stay in the grief and go in the grave with it, or you can be the person saying, I'm actually going to put that to rest. I have no idea how. feels like I'm just going to fall apart. But I can't control all that. But I know somebody who does and who will. So I'm just only going to say, I got nothing good to say right now, so I can only say what the Word says. See, so it's a choice. I'm coming over to where the Word says this. Oh, but it just feels so opposite. Why are we? Uh, I just want to go crawl in a hole. I just want to cry till I can't cry anymore. And, I, and sometimes you need a moment where you're like, give me a moment. I just need to lose it. Right? But don't make that a plan of your life. Lose it if you need to. And then get back up and say, I'm going over where my destiny is. Amen. And in my destiny is, is God's faith. Have the faith of God is what the word says. Um, it says, you know, put your trust in God is one way it says it. But when you look in the original, it says have the faith of God. Well, I don't know how to have the faith of God unless I'm in God. Unless I'm over here in him, on his track, going his way. As soon as I pull away from that, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have to be that tight with him on that moment to get this thing moving. And it's by a choice. It's by a choice. I have suffered a lot of losses in my life. And I've done the, you know, close the blinds, stay in the room, you know, cry. And it's almost like the feeling is like, so, you know, eventually if someone actually loves me, they'll come. That's when pity starts to, to, to take place. And it hurts. And it, it, it can make you sick. And then I've done the other thing that like, wow, that just gutted me. <laughs> you know, it's just the picture of like, all right, I'm walking around with this sword in my gut. But by golly, I'm going to get back up and come over here where faith is. And I'm going to let that faith track that I'm on blow my face off. And if there's a, something needs to be removed, it'll be removed on this track. Our expectation is here's where the wonderful things are. Here's where the grieve in the grave is. Until I'm done with this, I can't go over there. Actually, that's the thing that's going to heal this. That's the thing that's going to bring this to closure. But our belief system is we got to sit in it. We got to wonder about it. We got to... Oh, 
It hurts like crazy. Nobody wants to cry and feel pain. Nobody wants to have that, that, that type of yuck feeling. But I feel like if I'm going to do it, let's do it productive. Like if, if I'm going to suffer, I want to suffer well. If this is going to hurt, then let's do it. Right? Bring it. Let's, I want to feel all of it until everything just comes out. If I'm going to look messy, then let's do this. Not dripping, mascara, running, I don't care, let's have it. Because that's what's going to bring me over as I'm saying, I'm not going to stay in this grief, nor are you going to put me, grave, equal with you. Uh-uh. This is an event that took place. These are people that I've loved or whatever the situation is, but I can't let that rob my destiny. And over here in my destiny is the joy of the Lord. Over here in my, my destiny is where I'm supposed to be going, how I'm going to finish. But by taking one person out and causing you to go into a grave situation or grieving situation, it can literally affect the destiny of people around you and your destiny and y'all end up in the grave. You could live to be 90, but you've been in a grave all your life. Sexual abuse can do that. Beatings can do that, can cause you to go into a grieving. And you grieve it, and you grieve it. Can, it causes you to, if your parents weren't there to you, you can't go to a playground because you see parents with their kids, and it causes you to go into grief. Well, if I'm going to grieve that, let's say that's my situation, then bring it. I want to feel the full thing. I want to take this thing apart every which way that I can. And I'm going to bring that over, and I'm going to put it at the feet of my God's faith. Right? And I'm like, this impossible thing is now becoming possible. I don't know how. I don't need to know how. I'm not in control. He's in control. But over in the grave, I'm in control. I'm in control of how long I want to grieve, how hard I'm going to feel this, if I want pity, if I don't want to deal with what I'm really angry about. See, sometimes a loss of something can trigger the thing we lost before, and that's really what we're angry about. See, you lose a friend right now, but it really ties into some things that happened to you when you were a kid, where there were losses and you never got over that. Well, now this attaches to this, and now you got a bigger grave, and you're grieving it, but all of the emotion of it is stuck on this thing that's happening now. When it's actually bigger than what's happening now, it's the things we didn't get over when we were younger. It's the things we didn't grieve through and bring to closure. And we all have those things. It's so important it, as, a, as a leader, you know, if, if this was military, right? My mind thinks military. And so if this was military and, and I was a general and I'm like, we are getting ready, you know, I need you guys to be ready for battle rattle tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to take the hill on the west side. Uh, there's an enemy there. There's this type of thing, blah, blah, blah. And I go through. And if you don't get into your training, if you're not into that, when we go to take the hill, anything that you're presently grieving will cause uh, a hurt uh, to overtake you. It'll cause the hurt to overtake you where you won't be able to participate. And it's part of your destiny, right? Right? It's part of us all moving together. It's part of us to, to come up into things. And, and so you got to have a medic on the, on the team for anybody, but no soldiers really left behind. We need to be able to bring people forward with us, whether they're grieving or not. We need to be able to bring that closure so we can all stay together on a team, moving toward our destinies. But if half the church is wounded and stuck in grief, especially grief that happened 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I'm not sure we want to take that hill. Right? Yet we all grieve in some area. It's to identify what are you presently grieving right now? What is the loss right now? We want to come over into faith in this area. Um, we, we, it's just, there is something called the spirit of heaviness that the scripture talks about. It, it literally is, is kin to oppression. When we're by the grave, you know, let's just walk through a funeral. And funerals are done, done different ways. But you have the shocking thing of like, 
I can't believe it. They're gone. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. They're gone. And, you know, the nurse, the doctor gives you the final. Blood. They toe tag. They do the whole thing. It's like, <gasps> right? And you go home that night just dizzied if it's somebody very close to you. It's just like, what? How? What? What? It's hard for you to wrap your mind around it. And then the next process uh, many times is you've got to meet with the funeral director, right? Isn't it interesting the funeral director really has a very similar job to uh, a fireman who's trying to get you out of the building when you're in shock? I need you to look at me. We're going to fill this paperwork out right now. This is how the funeral can go. And if they're good, they really make you feel comfortable and because you're in shock, it's a, it's a way of walking through that. Then many times they have some type of viewing of the body. Why? Because you got to go back and visit again. Yeah, this actually did take place. Everything in you that says, I don't want to see that. Yeah, we're going to take a look. We're going to see that. Um, and for some people, they don't necessarily need that. Other people definitely have to have that. But either way, there's something that says, I identify this really took place. And there's another surge of it that takes place. And you'll find many times um, at the funeral, people um, you know, are coming forward and they're sharing the person's life. They're sharing all kinds of wonderful things about them, which makes you cry because you miss that aspect of who they are and what you had. And, and that's a part of the grieving process. It's good to recognize that. If it's going to bring up the fullness of that emotion. We don't want to feel that emotion. We need to experience that emotion. We need to have that come up and go, yeah, and let the tears fly. And, and, but then many times we'll see where it gets even more emotional is if they left the casket open, and now it comes to the part of the service where we're going to close it. When does the family usually lose it the most? The closing. Interestingly, the person's been dead maybe a week. They've seen the body. They, there's something so final like, we're doing this. We're doing this. Many times family members will, you know, depending on the funeral, will be next to the casket when they close it. They'll be a part of that. And it's so like this is really final. A loss of a friendship can walk through very similar things. when you really realize that actually we're about to close this, that's when it hurts the most all over again. So many times we run from closure. Well, I found out that relationship died or I found that this thing, I'm just not going to face it, I'm not going to face it. No, sometimes things need to be brought to a close and you need to look at the lid going closed. No, there's got to be a way. There gotta, we can't. Uh, sometimes it just needs to close. And it hurts. Then there's the, the, the next step, right? The pallbearers, the people that were closest to uh, the person who passed, carry the body out. Which is another way of saying, yeah, this is really going somewhere. This is really happening. And you have to face it. right? And, and then the next one that gets to be really big, casket closed, might have been you viewed him, that was big casket closed. Now it's the grave site. A lot of us have gone out to the grave site. That's a very emotional thing because there's something different from closing the casket to covering it with dirt. The dirt says all the way done. Over. Right? We've brought this to close to the point it's all the way done and it's over. And then at that point, you don't forget the memory of the person, but you have to move on in your destiny. So the gravestone is that thing that says who they are and when this took place in your mind, in your heart, in your family, whatever the situation is. And you can take that illustration and put it against maybe not a death. You can put it against something emotional, a loss of a job or, or something like that. There comes a point, you've got to close it. You've got to carry it out. You've got to say some words over it of release, forgiveness, whatever it is that you need to say, and then it gets buried. It doesn't get buried before you've done those things. That's the way it gets to the grave to begin with. 
And so even in emotional things, there's a process that we have to go through. And if we go back to visit it, when something's been brought to closure, you go back to visit, what you're visiting is the gravestone. Oh, that's right. Oh, Anna died in 42. Yep. See, that's different. That's when it's been brought to close long enough that the pain of it is, uh, is, is just a fleeting memory or it's something that might bring a little tear to your eye, but you know it's fully closed. That's what he wants us to learn about taking anything that we're grieving. There is a process that we go through. And sometimes you need um, the funeral director. You need somebody to help you come along and say, hey, I need you to look at me. We're going to fill out this paperwork. We're going to talk about this. Let's make some plans of how we're going to bring this to close. Right? And then that, it, funerals are very spiritual. They're very spiritual. And it's great when we know where someone has gone, uh, you know, when they've gone home. I mean, if you got the term, uh, I lost uh, my friend or I lost my husband, that's because you don't know where they are. They're not lost if you know where they are. There's a difference in that. Um, but as a person goes uh, through the, the funeral, if you just look at a funeral, there is, I mean, it can be really gr grave. It can really be grieving. And it needs to bring up all those emotions. Because what you're trying to do as a, as a, uh, a funeral is going on, really what the minister should be doing is bringing people as close up into faith as you can. Not denying what's gone on, but helping to bring to closure because what we're trying to do is come over into face. Now, we have a destiny. We know where they've gone, right? It's hard if we're thinking they went the other place. I mean, that's a hard situation. But in a Christian's life, we know where they've gone. It's, it's like, but we're going to finish this race. Well, it's no different if you lose a friend emotionally, you lose a job, uh, you lose an argument, <laughs> Whatever it is that has pierced your soul and hit your spirit like a, like a dagger, there's a process you go through. And you can go through that quickly, or you can take the time. All depends on who you are and the choices that you make, and neither one is wrong. But the point of this morning is to figure out what you're grieving and what you are now going to do with that. How are you going to plan the funeral of this thing that you're grieving? Who's going to be involved? I don't know. I might need to go talk to somebody. You might need to get some counseling on it. You might need to take some time to pray or get some outside input. Because there's things in our life that we're carrying that need to have a headstone and be done. Yeah, amen. And we can go back and visit them and say, yep, that happened in 65. Yep. Yep. Ever walk through a, a, a graveyard just to do it? We've done it on vacation because they had like different soldier areas or whatever. And you just go walk. It's just interesting. Like, oh, this little baby died at two months. Or, you know, you see the different thing. Uh, but you're not in the process of grief. You're visiting something that happened. And anything that we don't have closure to, I say this over and over, you will relive if you don't have closure to it. When it hits your memory, you relive it. You don't recall it. When you go to a site where you, you uh, buried something and you put a headstone on it and you brought it to closure, you may go to that, have a few memories about it, but I'm not going to really live that whole thing. I already did those emotions. I already did that. I cried until I felt like I was going to throw up. I, I, I did the being angry. I did the, you'll find that you went through the whole process, and when you get there, it doesn't bring up the same thing because you already did it. Don't be afraid of grief. It never was intended for us, and so we have to master it. Doesn't mean that we skip it because the emotions are going to be there. It's a result of sin. It's not sin itself, but it is a result of how the sinful world system works. Death was never intended to be here in any manner. It's a result of sin. And so when that hits us, uh, the losses, and it, I can even feel how somber it feels in here right now. You know, I should be talking about something of faith. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna next week. We're gonna come back, and we're gonna come from the grave to the steps it takes 
to get back on the track, still knowing I can go back and visit the graveyard any time I want to. Yeah, and if God wants something raised from the dead, he will give me the faith to do it. See, nothing's final until he says so. But we bring closure to something, and he says, no, nah, I want you to go raise that from the dead. Well, it doesn't matter if it's got a gravestone or whatever. You're raising it from the dead into life. That's a whole different thing than digging up the grave and looking at the body and grieving all over again. We do that. Then we put the dirt back on. Okay, all right, I'm done. And then next week, come back, put the dirt back on. It's No, it'll wear you out. It'll take you out. See it? Some of us have gone through things that were a shock mentally, and the mental imagery in our mind uh, isn't something you can just pop on over and forget. There's flashbacks. There's those different things. Um, yeah, those are there, and I'm not saying to just skip over that. What I'm saying is recognize they're there and call a spade a spade. Call it what it is and grieve through it. Get the counseling, get the help, get the counsel from Holy Spirit, get the counsel from the Word, get the counseling uh, from other people that say, we're going to come alongside and we're going to bring you out of that situation. Because if anything dies here today, it ain't me. I'm going that way. Sexual abuse? No, sorry. You're going to go to the grave. I'm going that way. Abuse in the family? You stay right there. I'm going to put a headstone here pretty soon. I'm going that way. Neglect? Right there, that's the grave for you. Already bought a plot for you. <laughs> right? It's, there's some things that we need to find a plot for. And, uh, and some things uh, we just need to uh, cremate. Yeah. Amen. It's like, ah, let it go through the fire. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, it's sick when you think about it. We have a big body, right? But um, when, when it goes through the fire, it ends up in a little urn because that's all that's left to it. We're just dirt and water. And that, that many times it can represent that thing that just feels so big inside of us. But you run it through the fire of the Holy Ghost, and it'll be cremated. You can just set that thing down and walk away. And walk away. Now, there's a difference. I don't want you to entangle. If you're suffering today from the loss of a loved one, um, or I should say it better for, you know, just missing them, uh, you know, or there was something tragic attached to it or whatever, you know, that, that's a little bit different. Uh, that's one side of grieving. But the things that we, we can be grieving things. Let me give you an example of it. You can be grieving the season of life you're in. I knew that one would go, I don't like being 53. I, I, you get wrinkles. It's, what is happening there in the mirror, you know? It's like, why is it? And you can laugh about it and whatever, but for some people, there is a grieving. It feels like such a loss. It feels like a regret, like I should have, could have, would have done in the past, and I didn't, and, I, you know, and now I'm at this spot, and why didn't I? And we begin to punish ourselves, and we're stuck over here grieving it and graving it and not even sure what to do with it, and we're supposed to be over there. Just because we are grieving the season of life we're in. Hmm? We grieve the season. There's many things like that. If we don't recognize that that's what we're really grieving and, and then take that apart, let's say it's the season. Why does it bother you so much? Well, I don't like the aging process and I don't like how I slow down and I don't like what's going to happen with that. What does that go back to? And you keep peeling that onion to get to the core. Many times it's like, I feel like someone's going to leave me. I feel like I'm going to die like my mother. I feel like, I mean, there's some kind of fear thing attached to that grief. And that's why you're grieving that season. It's like, I didn't want this to come. I don't want to be here right now. See how it, it can go that deep. That's how grief works. So when you're in the process over here and the thing's trying to take you in the grave with it and you pull over here and you go, hold on, I'm planning your funeral, but I'm staying in faith. I'm planning your funeral. Suddenly, you're going to get the download from the heavenlies. What you're really grieving about, that'll help you with the funeral. But if you stay over in this, you're just talking to the thing that violated you to begin with. It's not going to have a good answer or good reasoning or good anything for you. It's the thing that's like, it's too much. 
So you have to separate away to somebody who's higher than you, thoughts that are higher than you have, ways that are higher than you think, and stay over here while you're saying, yeah, we're planning your funeral. That's going to go to close. I'm not dragging this with me. That's really the power of death is when it captivates you here. We, we think the power of death is in that moment when you take your last breath, and it's so horrible that, hey, hey we're, as Christians, we're just transferring where we live. It ain't that big a deal. It might not look pretty, you know, from this side of things. From the heavenly side, it's like, yeah, come out of that wrecked up thing. Come on, you know, and, and come home. Uh, we look at it like that, but really, if sin has a payday of death, and the sin that's rampant on this earth uh, that's just attacking us and around us and in the heavenlies and all of those different things that, that's after us, that's really the death that's at the enemy that we got to go after. Yeah? If we don't go after that, that could actually drag us into uh, the grave, the actual grave, a whole lot earlier than we should go. It causes sickness and disease. It causes mental illness. It causes all kinds of different things if we get stuck there. So we have to figure out a way. And next week when I come back, I'll be talking about, um, come back like I'm leaving. But I do go home. Yeah, anyways, um, <laughs> I'll come back that way. Um, so uh, when, when we revisit this again, I'll say it like that. We're going to go on to what faith looks like in this and start taking apart some of the things um, that, that you could be grieving right now. It's very important that you know that. How many of you are excited about figuring that out? Probably nobody. Well, we got somebody. We got somebody over here. Because that means you have to feel it. I didn't come here to church to feel anything. I want to feel happy. So why aren't you downloading happy? Why don't you give me? Because you're pretending. You get this happy surface frosting, but underneath there's a rotten cake. Right? I'm just like, let's just bake the cake over. Then you can have both. Does that work? Yeah. I, I, and so remember that the word blessed means empower to prosper and to have success down the road. Is this grieving, graving, Sin hurts you, it damages you. You either participated in it or it happened to you. Um, it, is that process the blessing? No. So if the word blessed means to be empowered and prosper, to have success down the road, that means the word blessed is in motion and it's moving. The word death says sit still, you ain't moving, you're done. It's totally opposite of his kingdom. So we're trying to get the things in our life to come over to the things of this kingdom. And just because we can't figure out how it's going to fix, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It's a choice we make to come over. So let's stand. If you have any pity in you this morning, this sermon irritated you. Just so you know. Because wherever there's like, feel sorry for me, it's like, shut up, Pastor Mary. You don't even know what I'm going through. You know, there'll be those kind of feelings. I know because I've had them. <laughs> and you don't want to hear about that. But yet the truth still is, it's in faith that we conquer everything. We're faith beings, we're spiritual beings that conquer everything through faith. So how do we get from over here into faith? It's a process, and I'll talk about some steps to get over here to over here. We talked about to get to the grave, but we're going to talk about how to transfer over here. So Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that we come to a place within ourselves that we see what we're actually grieving. We might think we're grieving a loved one uh, who we miss, when really we're suffering with abandonment issues. We might think that we're, we're grieving, uh, having worked at a place where we had friends and stuff, and now we've got to transfer. Uh, that, that that's just people pushing us around like we were pushed around when we were young. That's really what we're grieving. Uh, we don't like change. And so, Father, we, I just ask by your Spirit, Holy Spirit, move upon us in a way that we can see the thing we're really grieving about. What is it that's really bothering us? And what is our destiny that we can lay hold of and stand there for for that, no matter what comes our way, no matter what we feel? 
We're faith beings before we're feeling people. We're created spiritual faith beings before we're feeling people. We have feelings, but we're faith beings first. And so, Lord, show us what is happening even right now that we need to let go. What needs a headstone? What needs the casket closed on? What do we need to even show up and visit and say, yep, yep, I can identify that. There it is. Yep. Yep. What is it in this process? Where are we at? Download that to us now in the name of Jesus and cause us to come up uh, up into a new area of faith where we can actually get excited about going through. I'm going to get going through this pain because I'm coming out the other side. I'm not going to stay stuck and the grave cannot have me. In Jesus' name, amen. And don't be somber about it. Be excited about it. But know, know this, the quicker you go through the pain, the quicker you can come out the other side. The more you go around something, you come back to the same wall, right? Trying to get around it, same wall is there. You're going to hit it every single time. God wants us to go through the wall. Amen. That's what we're going to do in the next couple of weeks here. All right. Praise God.